there's two things in life that we can't escape, death and taxes. And neither one of us like either one of them. So I think really trying to make death beautiful, trying to make it normal, trying to take the fear out of it, trying to help people navigate that uncertainty because it is uncertain. Life is short, we should make the most of it, we should live our dreams, but also we should not fear death. And when we pass over, there is another life on the other side. And I think that just brings a lot of comfort to people. Try to help people see that there is life after death. Tell me a religion that doesn't believe in the afterlife. My role here is just really to prove your own religion and to prove that there is a continuum of life into the afterlife. So I encourage people just to take a moment to respect where they're at. It's a beautiful transition of surrendering into something that is inevitable and it's gorgeous and i think everybody should die beautifully welcome everyone i am so excited today i'm always excited but i am super excited today to have lisa williams lisa is a dear friend of mine now we met back at an event recently it was about a year ago actually yeah, november that 2021 20, yeah 21 oh my gosh it's been a little more than a year and Lisa is a psychic medium. She's also a TV host and a spiritual teacher and author. And I recently learned that you are like the number one psychic in the world. And I had no idea. And so it's such an honor to have you. It's so I, I just want to start by saying I, I have a wide variety of guests on the show. And what I found so interesting is just how tapped in you are with just not just your psychic abilities, but just with people in general, your intuition. Yeah. So I want viewers who are watching this to be open-minded. If perhaps your religious beliefs and you think, oh, I'm not into psychics, there's more to it than this. So stay tuned because this is really going to be a great talk about a lot of different things. And we're going to touch a lot on a program she has coming up this weekend, actually, April 15th and 16th, 2023 where she's really working with people. It's called dying in the light. And this is something that really is near and dear to my heart because I lost my husband almost seven years ago. And I think so many times we deal with loss and grief and we don't know how to face that. Or we feel like there was conver there perhaps conversations that weren't said, or we feel like we've like there was something we, we left on the table. And you've helped me in my journey through this process go through that. And I want to say too, really quick before we go into this, is that growing up in a Catholic home and then Christianity in my beliefs and thinking this is might be a little bit, I'm not sure about this. I've talked to prophets in the Christian space who have given me a word that I didn't ask for, but they gave me a word. And I've talked to you. And ironically, right at the same time, the messages were the same. Yeah. And I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. So yeah. I definitely encourage everyone to sit tight and listen and be open-minded today. So with that, Lisa, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you again, as I said, and I just can't wait to hear from you. So yeah. tell us a bit about what you do and then Ooh. we'll ask some questions. Boy, so I started off, I've been doing this work for over 30 years. So I started off as a psychic medium well before it was trendy, anything like that. And I was given the golden opportunity to come to America, obviously I'm English, by Merv Griffin. And Merv Griffin opened the door and he created a TV show around me. And it became this amazing worldwide hit. And I went on, I did red carpets, Oprah, you name it, Jimmy Kimmel, Today Show, every imaginable TV show I did. And what I've found over my journey is I've, it's not just been psychic mediums because psychic medium has a, a, this connotation that, oh, it's scary, it's weird, you shouldn't predict and all of these things. But actually what I try to do is bridge the gap and help people walk home. Meaning that I try to help people see that there is life after death. And my dad is the ultimate skeptic, very cynical. And I've worked with a lot of religious people and I wanna address the religious part of it is that tell me a religion that doesn't believe in the afterlife. And so my role here is just really to be, to prove your own religion and to prove that there is a continuum of life into the afterlife. And if I can do that, much like you had a prophet who was Christian who dropped that one word in, 
we come out with the same messages. It's just, it's just the belief system. Big aim as a spiritual teacher, as a spiritual leader is to educate the masses that life isn't, life is short. We should make the most of it. We should live our dreams, but also we should not fear death. And when we pass over, there is another life on the other side. And I think that just brings a lot of comfort to people. I love that. And it's something I wish I had seven years ago because I, my, my late husband, Pat, his passing was unknown. It happened in a second. And so we knew that at some point we were preparing, there was an age difference. So we were always thinking that like it's someday, but it, there was that feeling of more than most couples or people I think is that we think that we're going to live forever. And we don't anticipate but if we have that opportunity where someone's perhaps suffering or they're dealing with the chronic illness and we know that it's an eminent or eminent is that we can prepare. And yeah. so I love what you're, I watched this amazing promo video you sent to a small group of us about this program and about, you know, how to work with someone, how to give them compassion and how to have, just help them find peace. And I think so many of us don't know how to deal with death and with the process. What do we say to people? And I'd love for you to delve into this thing about the end of life journey is we, even though we may feel lost and uncertain about what's going to happen is how do we become those expert navigators, as you've said, and guiding our loved one on their journey and giving them have grace and wisdom to provide comfort and peace. And how can a psychic medium like you, what is this that sets it apart that helps us have those tools to do that? So I think I've often been coined with the term queen of death, which sounds awful, but because I navigate death so well. I wrote a book, Survival of the Soul, which was actually the book that I gave out at that event that I met you on. Yes. And it is about what happens when we die. It is about the transitional space that we go into, how our soul elevates from this conscious body, this conscious world. We go up into the spirit world. We go up into a world that we only know from life between lives. And we don't really remember consciously in this life. And so... My aim, and this has been a project of passion for me for a long time, because I've had so many people say to me, what does happen when we die? How am I going to overcome this? Is my loved one okay? And preparing for someone's passing is very hard. And I think it, I had to face my own mortality and my husband is military. So I think about what would happen if he got deployed and the things that he got into and I think about other people and I've been invited into hospice at end of life care. I've seen so many people pass away. And I've also supported many people who have had tragic losses like you did, where you weren't able to prepare. And it was like my world turned on a dime. And my husband was exactly the same. He lost his wife and it was like this. It was like, boom. And so what my aim has been over the last few years is to actually give comfort to people to know, yes, life continues on, but also to face the inevitable. But there's two things in life that we can't escape, death and taxes. And neither one of us like either one of them. So I think really trying to make death beautiful trying to make it normal, trying to take the fear out of it, trying to help people navigate that uncertainty because it is uncertain. And I get inundated by pictures and photographs and when are they going to let go and why aren't they passing now? And so a lot of the time it's just comfort, letting people know this is normal, this is okay, this is the process what you're going to experience next is this and understanding that grief has many layers to it and I feel that once we can appreciate the layers of grief and we can normalize death and we can normalize the grief process then we don't feel so weird and when we are hit with waves of depression and we are hit with waves of anger that we realize oh I, this is normal and I think again in today's society we have to also deal with mental health and so the mental health elements of this is not normal come on grow up don't be so sad it's fine Jill it's been seven years you should be okay but but you're going to be hit by moments to realize it's normal and yes. so I think that's just been something that I really want to educate people on is this uncharted territory that we don't know how we're going to feel one day to the next I love that because I think 
it's a, as a widow and having other friends, surprisingly, it's amazing how you meet so many other people. I didn't know about Chris. I've met Chris mm-hmm. and in Vail last month and saw you again. And I had no idea, but it's fascinating that we hear stories and we, I find myself sometimes comparing, like you said, it's been seven years. I have a really good friend that lived in the same town I did. And we went to yoga together and her husband died 10 weeks before mine, same exact cause. And so I found myself going, I heard she's, she dated, started dating someone, she remarried and I'm going, what's wrong with me, Joe? What is wrong with you? It's, it's, it's the comparison. You should be, it's people say you should be over it, get over it. And I don't think we all grieve differently, I think is what everyone says. And it's so true. We do. And I think what we have to realize, and I have so many clients come to me that say, oh my God, was my wife upset that I married her best friend six months after? And I'm like, no, she probably set you up. Or, oh my gosh, I have not met anybody and I don't want to meet any. Is my husband upset because I just don't? I'm like, we all grieve differently. Mm. And I think what we have to do is stop the expectation. That's what society has given us is an expectation. Come on, you should be okay now. Come on, stiff up a lip. And I lived in a society like that for years because I'm English. And now <laughs> I realize that we have to be a little bit more warm and squishy and we have to appreciate that everyone's different. I love that. And I think that too, it's, I guess, a question I would have is someone who is grieving, who may have just lost a loved one. Is it possible? I know that you've done this. I've watched you do it. I've been present. You've worked with me in for you to tap in can you tap in at any time do you, there are a couple of questions first one i guess would be can you tap in at any moment or do you have this like prep work or does it come to you like out of nowhere you're in the shower or you're like middle of the night you wake up and you feel this energy you feel someone's presence or can you like turn it on and just go okay here it is i'm going to do i'm going to find ask someone to come and, and be present so it's interesting and i'll answer those in two different elements if someone said to me that, hey, Lisa, I want to read in and, and I have an appointment, then yes, I prepare. I have an intention. I set myself up. But if someone is coming to me or I'm present for someone's passing. So I'll just come back into the one that happened in December. And I was there for her passing and I was with the spouse and the spouse. She, they're going through this immense amount of emotion, an immense amount of trauma, an immense amount of guilt, and all of these emotions are going on. And the worst thing to actually do in that moment is, as a medium, is to step in and go, oh, this person's here, and then do a reading. And I always say to people, do not have a reading just after you have lost someone. Because, oh, absolutely. And I tell you why is because emotionally you're not ready you may think that you want it you may crave it but it can do more harm than good and so I'm the one person that will say do not and so as I'm staying with this person as I'm navigating her path and as I'm helping her overcome her wife's grief and her wife's transition and we're doing all of these things she said to me is she here is she there what is she doing where is she And so I will just tap in and I'll just glance and I will be able to just, I always call it like a kiss from the universe. I'll do a kiss from spirit and I'll be like, I feel her energy and she's okay. So I'll kiss in because I feel that if what I'm doing is if I go straight into a reading, I'm going to create someone who needs and craves and relies on my gift to then navigate their own life in that deep sense of grief. But what they have to do is they have to find their own pathway. So in order to answer your question, I can do it both ways. I do think it's very important at some point that maybe they have a reading if they want that closure. But also in those moments that where they're constantly looking for signs. At the beginning when someone has passed over, we're looking for the license plate, the butterfly, the rainbow, the penny. We're looking for those signs. And so that's when I can just do that little kiss from the universe and say, yes, they're here. What are they saying? I don't know. They're just standing here smiling. And I think that's it. There's two elements to it. And I think it's a very fine line of one, not to create a need and a psychic junkie and all of that, but also just to help that person navigate and know I'm not alone. 
Uh, oh, wow. It, I think that's, that's so comforting to, to feel that and to know that someone's not alone. And I love what you said about don't get a reading right after someone passes. I, that would make perfect sense to me. Had I done that, I think it would have been like, I would have been hanging on every word. Like you said, becoming a junkie because it's, I'd want to, it's, you want more. It's like you almost, it's like not being in reality and wanting to can't wake up and make a move without hearing from spirit on, on what should I do today? What should I eat for breakfast kind of thing? And so it can get a little, I see where that would get a little bit because it's hard to move forward when we're relying on that, those words. But at some point I had questions that were left unanswered and I found such peace in hearing what his desires were for me. And it was too real to say, oh, this is BS. There were just too many, there are things that that you said that others have said that I went, there's no way they could look this up on the internet. There's no way that, that anyone would know this. These are little things that we shared together, little innuendos or whatever. And so I'm really blown away. And I'm, I just, again, I think being open-minded about this is something that can be a real gift. If you chair, you want to stay in that space of just leaning in and giving it a try, you know, uh, my next question would be, can anyone do this? Or are you born with these gifts? Is this something that we, maybe when we're children, actually I was talking to someone yesterday who works with me. And he said that when his son or his brother died, when he was three years old, suddenly, and a few years later, uh, he just, or I don't know how long it was, but he said that he went from being a very rebellious and active child to being very resigned and fighting everything. He was very difficult. And he said, he saw his brother come to him and they had this moment, he yelled for his mother. He said, my brother's here. And his mother came running. And of course she didn't see anything, but he did. But he, basically what he recalls is that his brother said, feel free to play, like play and be and live your life is what I got from this. And it transformed him in a minute. Wow. And so I say that to say, is this something that we maybe are more tapped into as children when, before we get all this other stuff put in and is, can everyone have this do we all start with the ability and then maybe we lose it or are some just gifted with it and others will never have it? And then can we learn it if we don't, if we've lost yeah. that power? All of the above. I think when we're young, we're so open. Society closes us down. Society conditions us. If we look at how our brain is wired, we have simple neuroplasticity that makes us absolutely believe in certain things. So our neural pathways are heading this way. Mine just so happened to have a spiritual family and a spiritual mom. So of course, my neural pathways are all open this way. And we're all completely open. And what we choose to believe becomes our reality, as we all know. What actually happens is we can all do this. And every single one of us, tell us somebody who doesn't trust their intuition. Tell me someone who hasn't said, I shouldn't go. No, I just don't feel right. No, I shouldn't go here. It's exactly the same. And tapping into that intuitive part will then open up and rewire our neural pathways to actually use a different part of the brain that we haven't been accessing. And so it's a simple thing that we can all do it. And I think it's like singing, like singing. We can all sing. Some people shouldn't really get out the shower singing, you know, but let them be themselves. But really and truly, if you wanted to learn to sing, you could actually go on and become and maybe have your favorite karaoke song and you go off and you learn to sing it. And then there's other people who can go on and train and become the next Christina Aguilera or something like this. But I think we all have that ability. It's just knowing how to harness it. I get that. I can see that. I, you know, I think I, I felt that a little bit more myself when I was younger. And again, I think it's just that we end up ha facing this. Th this is, you have to see it to believe it. And then we start to lose touch with those things. Are there times that you, when you are with, with someone or someone's asking for a reading, do you have moments when you can't connect with someone? And if not, why would that be? I've had very few moments in my time where I can't connect. And often that's because myself, to be honest with you, either I'm not in the headspace most of the time. So today I was technology failed me doing a reading. I turned up my, everything, everything failed me. And I'm, we finally reconnect about 25 minutes after the start of the reading, which is unlike me. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And then suddenly her mom stepped in or their mom stepped in. And I said, she really hated technology. She said, oh yeah, everything just went wrong. And I went, oh, 
now. So often when I can't connect, it's normally because of either something that they were like in spirit in life. And so I'm just mimicking them and I mislead, I miss interpret it for it to be me but most of the time it's I can normally connect and it's normally if I can't because I don't know I've been tired I've been traveling I've been doing this and that but the rest of the time yeah I can pretty much connect when I want and I enjoy it I think that's great I've talked to another psychic who basically it takes a lot of work. Like he was saying, I don't do them very often. And it's, I'm meditating for two days before I do one. And it's just, wow, that sounds like a lot of work from a business model. That's, that doesn't sound very, it's a little bit tricky, but I think it's amazing that I think it's maybe it's a also muscle. Like you said, the more you're doing it, the more tapped in you are, and you probably just can really connect. And, um, how do you, are there, uh, I guess another question I have speaking of other psychics is, this is such a big thing today. I dated a guy who was really into tarot card reading. So it was like every day, the same reader and he's sending me the YouTube link and it's oh, okay. So then we'd be like get every day and talk about being a junkie. I was in this space for a while where it's like every day I have to watch it and it would determine what I did. And it would say what about a partner and it's, oh, is this like us? And so we start to almost guide our lives. Like you said, based on what someone's saying or not saying. And so how do we know the authenticity? How can we determine? Is that possible to say, ah, oh, or just, is it got like, maybe it could be like that person was on today, but they're not on today for me. Or are there, those are just not legitimate and we should steer clear. How do we know the signs? We're in a world of technology. Okay. And one of the things I actually don't do so many readings now, I now empower people to do it themselves. I'm all about, let me teach you how to find your signs. Let me teach you how to read the nav to navigate and how to get a really good reading with somebody else. And I think one of the things I say to a lot of my students and a lot of my clients is trust your gut instinct. If something is not fitting for you, if there's something maybe you don't like the sound of their voice. Maybe you're like, oh, some, and you're trying to work out what it is. And you're like, oh, I don't know. Don't listen. It's not working for you because our souls have to work and how it works, we work on frequency. So as we know, our body works on a frequency. Our body is our barometer. Our mind is going to tell you, I want to eat sugar. I want to eat out. I want to drink alcohol. I want to do this. Your body's going, no, you need water. Oh no, you need good food. You need broccoli. And mind's going, no, ice cream. Our brain is telling us something, but our body is really the barometer. And it's actually our guide. It's our intuitive guide because it's attached to the limbic system, which is our, our limbic brain, which is our emotional brain. It goes down in the vagus nerve. It hits our stomach like oh and so we get really con connected to our intuition but our mind goes no that's warm and squishy oh my god that's really sweet I want to taste that and really we have to override our brain when you have been said oh you know this person's really good listen to the tarot because you're constantly listening and start we start rewiring our neural pathways to start listening but the body was going no over here so we have to actually listen to our body more so than our mind and that's what's going to be your gauge. I love that because that is exactly what I've heard from Svetlana Newsom, Jeremy's wife, yeah. and worked with her. And she's she was teaching about that. And she said to me that our intuition you, knows immediately. The guy's right for you if you should be doing something, if not, whatever. And what happens is then our thoughts, our brain, our mind, our body goes, it tries to talk our intuition out of it or into it. And it's, oh no, it's okay. It's not a big deal. Everything's right. You can eat ice cream. It's not a big deal. You haven't had it in at least three hours to so go for it or whatever. It's, we can justify anything, yeah. but the intuition, usually if we're really in tapped in, which I'm really getting good at is it screams at us sometimes, not in a negative way, but you will feel such dis-ease in your body Yep. because the more aware we are is that this, oh, suddenly there's this off feeling and I'm like, I mm, don't know. And yet there's this the voices, it's almost like the devil and the angel on the shoulder feeling those cartoons. It's, do it, don't do it. Yeah. So it feels like that. And when we're really tapped in, and I love that that's so much part of that there's such a part of this in it, and that you teach others how to really feel that as well and to really be aware of it. And one of the things you offer that I love too is, which I think is so encouraging for so many who may be already wanting, having psych, some psychic abilities and they're wanting to do more, is get that certification, get some like legitimacy to their work and you offer certification programs, right? I think you have three or so. Yeah, I have several actually, because I think in this, my aim when I first started this was to create credible psychics in the world. Cause people used to say to me, who can I go to? 
And I have this waiting list that is long as your arm and everything else. So I wanted to create credible, reputable psychics to make this industry credible and reputable. And by putting a certification by someone who is reputable, someone who is well known, someone who has got an industry standard. And I think that's what's missing in this world is creating an industry standard. Then you know that person has legitimacy. That is important for anybody. And so I welcome people. I have master teacher programs. So I teach teachers how to teach this. I have well over several thousand certified students. And I also do a lot with the police as well. So I do forensic certification as well. So there's, I think it's important in today's day and age to have some form of recognition in this industry. Yes, I think that's so amazing. I love the fact the forensic work. We forget about that, but how many times I grew up in Atlanta and I remember when they had that big thing with all the missing and murdered children and they were calling psychics in and they were finding those kids. Yeah. I totally forgot about that until just now, but that's so valuable. So yeah. valuable. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And you, and so I think that's a great offering for those that are looking at that. And I know I saw too that on your website and when they get in your community that they get, you can actually, for those of you who are listening and watching, if you're wanting more information, Lisa has this incredible resource, so many resources on her site and your Instagram and YouTube that will post everything in the description, but you have this great six week, I think it's a six week course or a six, something you offer that's, that's free as well, right? For those just yep. getting started and want more. Yep. You can just come in if you want to learn and understand it. So it's intuition and it's there for you because I think it's so important to actually tap into that. And not only just for your loved ones, but for relationships, for business, for just everyday life. It's a game changer. It's so encouraging to hear that, that we're not always relying on someone else and for those who are really feeling it, that they have the ability to do something and that you're offering that. And it's, I'll teach you how to do it yourself. Yeah. And that's part of what this is. And then your weekend program that you have going on. I know you'll always have other things happening. So that's really amazing. And again, we'll drop those links to for, so everyone can access and find you and all of the greatness that you offer. And then another question, going back to something you said about energy and trusting intuition, are there ways, and do you feel like those that are still living, can you be in the presence of someone and get a sense of their energy and whether or not their intentions are right or they're, or having that sense of like, not just, are they right for me, but that trust issue, is there something off? Do, is there, is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually encourage people to do it. So I always encourage people when they meet someone new is to get in a neutral state. And this neutral state is, have I got an itchy here? Have I, am I feeling comfortable? And it's your neutral state. And then because our body works on frequency and as soon as our, as soon as someone steps into the room, our frequency will align with theirs, the auric connection will align and we start to then gel, okay, with each other. And that's when you go, oh, I really like you. But if something in you just feels off and what we have to do is we have to breathe and we go back into center and we breathe and we feel it and we have to ignore what our brain is saying, but they're really nice. They've got a cute top on. Oh my God, look how gorgeous they are. We have to get rid of this and we have to come back into that center and breathe and tap into that intuition and almost ask ourselves the question, is this person a good person? And you'll hear a yes or a no, or you'll feel this, ugh. You're, there's something that will work for you and everyone's different. Mine is very auditory and you'll hear it and you have to trust it. And again, this is the part where we override it. We hit override, override. There's the ice cream, there's the ice cream. So we keep hitting override. I have to encourage people to stop hitting override and trust the default mm. button of our intuition because that's the key. And you can do it anytime at any place business meetings, meeting a potential partner, going into a job interview, what, buying a car, whatever it is, your intuition is going to be there and you got to listen to it. Mm, I kids, I think we've all felt that. Don't, how many times have we all said we've been in a relationship or we got into a business relationship where we bought something and we always could go back and later and say, I knew it from the beginning and I did it anyway. I knew it. And it's like, why do we, when we know it, and then we still go through with it. It's like, it's that, it's that talking ourselves out of how, what's really, we know to be true. 
And so I think it's being so intentional, as you're saying, it sounds like you're saying is that being really intentional and listening, intentional listening of like feeling that and taking that moment because we're so busy all the time. And we're like, we, as soon as we hang up with one call, we're going on the next one without any prep time to even just take a moment to breathe and close our eyes for a second and say, okay, what do I want? What do I need? What is the purpose of this next call? And what is the expected outcome? And then it, or something like that, or just checking in general. And then this is just that feeling of with the person that or people that we're potentially working with, or even a decision we have to make about something on yeah. the spot. Yeah. And you mm. hit, you hit the nail on the head there actually, Jill, is that we're so busy. We're so busy r- running from meeting to meeting from day to go and see this person, to make a deal, to go here. I'm an entrepreneur. I put myself out there. This is just part of my world. So I'm running from meeting to meeting. I've got to book, write a book. I've got a publisher. I've got this. And it's having a br- moment to breathe and mm-hmm. setting my intention. And when we set our intention, our brain knows what we're going into. Our brain needs to be safe. And part of our intuition is feeling safe. And our intuition is our safety. It is what keeps us safe and has kept us safe from a child. So our intuition tells us something. So what we're doing is we're going, okay, I'm setting my intuition. So I'm setting my intention. Your intuition is going to work. Your brain is going, okay, I now know what I need to keep safe. And that's the most important thing because we are in a rat race. Social media, const- we're constantly being, we've constantly got this like a- attraction and these bright lights and going on and we're, stim- that was the word, stimulated, constantly being stimulated. And we really have to just say, okay, let's just stop. What is right for me? And then mm-hmm. we can tap in. Mm. Mm, I, I love that. It's so true is that just not being, st- we're so stimulated by everything and it's that taking the moment and it's not always the, the, the thing that makes sense and being okay with being okay with intuition saying it's over here and it's going to be against what everybody else in the room is saying. And Ooh. then having the courage to say, speak up when we need to. And that is the power. That is the power of taking it to the next level when we have that intuition. And even if it doesn't make sense and it's going to offend people or it's going to be against every what everyone other what people think we should do or not do. And so that's next level stuff, which you have helped me develop that courage. I know you did it in Bale with my idea and moving forward with, with the thing we were working on. And so it's just having that courage and not just going, okay, I feel it. I know it's there. Cool. It's now what are you going to do with it? Yeah. It's a next level, like 2.0. Okay. Not just yeah. I know. And that's the thing. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's now having the courage to recognize it and do something about it. Because again, if I'd have said to my dad, now I do, but many years ago, if I said to my dad, something's telling me I should be a psychic medium, he would, seriously, Lisa, you need your head testing. And I remember one day he actually said to me, Jill, this is so funny. When are you going to get a proper job? And I said, dad, I have a TV show. (laughs) (laughs) kind of a proper yeah. job <laughs> so I think funny. I'm doing okay here <laughs> I'm <doing> okay. <laughs> yeah yeah I think if you have if you've been on the, maybe the audience might not remember Merv Griffin but it's say Jay Leno or any of these others that are late night show. Merv Griffin was a pretty big deal then. yeah he and was yeah you got on yeah. Merv Griffin you were like whoa that's like huge yeah and it I love was that funny. story <laughs> when I didn't know who he was and he was just producing tv shows and he, when he create, he, I remember walking into his office and someone said, oh, I want you to meet Merv Griffin. I'm like, Merv who? And because I'm English, who's Merv? I've been over right. in the States for a very short period of time. And I was supposed to be back in England and it was just a chance meeting. And then I walk into his office and there's all these like pictures of presidents and Nancy Reagan on his desk. And I'm like, who is this dude with his dog? And I'm like, wow, okay. And as I walked out and he said, and I'm going down one flight of stairs. And he said, Lisa, get into my elevator. I'm like, you have an elevator for one flight of stairs? (laughs) And I went, okay. And he said, before you leave, why aren't you famous yet? And, and honestly, the one thing that I came out of my mouth is just like, I wanted to swallow the words were, because I've never met you yet, Merv. 
And little <laughs> did I know that two years later, I would be thrown on every red carpet, every, oh, you have no idea. And it was unbelievable. But, you know, what he saw was this, this I don't know, he just saw something, but it was so incredible. Yeah. And for some reason, again, my intuition always knew that there was going to be something bigger, but I didn't know how to get it. And this goes with what you were saying is intuitively, if I'd have been listening to tarot readers and astrologers and do this and do that, I probably would have geared my whole life to make it happen. But I didn't. Mm. I let my life live and intuit and then it automatically happens. So I also believe that if something's supposed to happen in your life, it's going to. If something's supposed to happen in your life, it's going to. Oh, I love that. And I also know this is that when I was asking you about readings, how often do you go and do you have a reading? And I know that I've heard, like you see TV shows, you hear people who see their psychic medium like every week or every other week, they call them every morning. Some of these are obviously extreme, but yours, yours, you have the belief that it's not often. It's yeah. it because this is for that reason of what you're saying is live your life and let it happen. Absolutely. I actually would say to people, have a reading once, once a year, check in maybe twice, twice a year. I had a reading, a friend of mine who had a reading with me only, I don't know, back in October. And she listened back to her reading. She's, oh my gosh, everybody needs to listen back to their reading six months later because she couldn't believe what had actually happened. And I feel that everybody should really give space for grace space for things to happen to make to make changes to have these ups and downs and I understand sometimes it's necessary to have it a little bit more or you get into a panic but once you breathe and allow that space for grace things are all going to work out exactly how it's supposed to be I love that and here's another question that just came to my head is what if someone when they're having a reading what if i haven't lost anyone in my life and who am i what is, how, what kind of how does the reading work for me if i don't have anyone that i'm going are you always going to someone or is there how does that work for someone who's not necessarily wanted to tap into a loved loss a loved one they've lost so first of all i will be i i commend them for being in that space and i'm like you are very lucky for not having lost somebody but not everybody needs that communication with spirit so I tap into their energy, I tap into their life path, I tap into their spirit guides, I tap into their aura. Sometimes it could be someone on the other side that they, you know, like a grandmother who was very strong in their life. So I, there's one comes for me for different reasons. And I think we have to get out of it. It's just psychic medium. It could be, I do intuitive readings, heart romance readings, helping them with business. I've, I've helped companies like <laughs> bring an idea to fruition on an intuitive basis and that's funny because my grandmother used to do that so I think really you, you're just tapping into the universal energy and you're tapping into the life path of, that they should be living I oh that's so neat I'm glad I asked that question because I started thinking about that I'm like there's there are definitely other places that other ways people can be served and I guess one final question and if you have anything else to add is again going back to someone who is about to lose someone is maybe delving into a little bit more about what's happening this weekend and how can they prepare, even if they can't make this weekend and say they, they're watching this after, how are some, what are some ways and are there things that they can do for themselves or to be, the, to be that, that for their family to help guide the process and make it a process that's light, as you said. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So a lot of people, let's say if that someone's passing, first of all, be gentle on yourself. Be gentle. Whatever emotion comes up is yours emotion to carry. If you're angry, then that's okay. If you're upset, that's okay. If you're sad, that's okay. If you're laughing, that's okay. And make sure that you have support because a lot of people go through this alone. The one thing I would say is if you're, if you're helping out a patient or a loved one who is in, let's say, hospice care, end of life, palliative care, comfort care, whatever you want to call it, is to know that the, it's unknown. They're unknown, but it's great to say it's okay to go, but don't keep saying it's okay to go, it's okay to go, it's okay to go. Say it once and then breathe. And then when people start getting agitated, especially if their breathing becomes like, more distraught hold their hand and just 
make very strong breathing sounds. And you'll find that as your frequency slows down, the patient's frequency is going to align with yours and be, you'll become at one. The other thing is people think that there needs to be stimulation, bright lights, TV shows. Don't take it down, put some soft music on, turn to nature, make it simple, bring photos in, talk about things that they used to do, talk about memories and have, recall these things. Because a lot of people just sit there and they go, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And that person, even though they're not conscious or they're sleeping, can actually hear. And one of my favorite times of going into hospice and working with my clients are, is late at night after 11 o'clock. I'll sneak in and I'll sit with them. And often they're just resting. And I remember they were like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm just here and I hold the hand. I'm like, are you okay? Yeah. I'm like, I'm just going to lay my head here. Is that okay? Yeah. And I'm holding the hand. I've got my head on the chair. And then what I do is I tap in and I allow my breathing to calm with them. And then I intuitively tap into me. And then I start to navigate a silent communication through soul to soul. And once I can connect that, and it can take 30 minutes to a couple of hours. But once I've started that navigation of soul to soul in that while they're still sleeping and they're still dreaming, but they're still conscious, then I know that when they are then at that point of end of life, I can still tap in soul to soul, check in. Are you OK? Is there anything that you need? Yeah, I wish they'd stop talking about this. OK, guys, can you stop talking about whatever you're talking? And it's that silent communication and it's so magnificent and it's so beautiful. And that is what the transition from this world to the next is. It's a beautiful transition of surrendering into something that is inevitable. And it's gorgeous. And I think everybody should die beautifully. That is so amazing. And yes, and I think that demystifying the whole idea of loss, anticipating loss, going through the process, if it's long, if it's an overextended period of time that you have advanced notice of it, or even when it happens so suddenly is just making it a beautiful experience. As you said before, even when we, before we started recording is the, this, um, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. We all will die. And how can we make it a process that we don't fear, even in spite of that, that we know that it, we don't know exactly what happens, but that we can honor and respect our loves and loved ones and giving, I love the fact that you give people the tools to be able to manage the process and that you hold space and show them how to do it. And you're also there for them. So thank right. you so much. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah. I love I look, thank you. Thank you. Anything else you would like to offer or say before we wrap up? I just am so happy you're here today. Yeah, no, I just think it's very important no matter where you are in life wherever, whatever you're doing in life, this is something we all have to face at some point. So I encourage people just to take a moment to respect where they're at, maybe even write a journal, write letters to their loved ones. If they've lost someone suddenly, find a way of closure, find a way of looking for the signs, find a way that they are able to communicate with you personally. And you may be that logical person, oh, I'm not feeling it, I'm not having anything. And it could just be that, moment where you see a license plate or you oh is that my mom and oh I don't know if you think it is just trust the universe that it really is I love that yes yeah, six signs I know when Ed died it was I was on a trip very shortly thereafter with a girlfriend who had lost her husband six years before that I think it was and we were in the Galapagos Islands and and I always had this thing about dolphins and I said it's like a memory it's a sign and we were on a boat and all of a sudden the biggest school of dolphins I had ever seen in my life were jumping. I don't know, hundreds. I, it was, I can't even begin to tell you how many there were, were jumping alongside the boat and they hung out with us all day. Oh my and God. I went, okay, that's, I'll take it. I'll take yeah. it. I Cause know. I was so numb and I was hurting so badly and not feeling anything. And here's my friend guiding me as a widow who had gone, walked me in this path already before and they hear these dolphins jumping. So yeah. It's amazing when the signs come. In fact, it's funny talking about signs. I remember, and I'm going to see if I've actually got it, but when my friends, yeah, I do. When my friend's wife passed away, uh, they just moved to Florida. And when they hadn't, they've been there a couple of years, but 
when they first got there, they did a heart and it was A plus A in a big heart in the sand. So we go walking that day and we're walking in a park that she used to walk in and she's, oh my God, I just want to see a sign. Just want to see a sign. And I go, stop. And she said, what? And I said, stop. And there, I don't know whether you can see, but there she's standing on a heart that says A plus S. And it wasn't, the obviously it wasn't the same no, one. It just no, it wasn't the random same one. Stuff on the side because the other one was in the sand that just showed they just, oh my gosh you can't ma- i mean that was only no, you can't make that up after her passing and you can't make it up it's amazing so yeah that. the signs are there you just gotta look for them gotta look for them and yeah one other thing you mentioned too early before we started recording is and i want to touch on this because everyone loves animals is what you always say about your dogs and animals and how they have those abilities to sense our energy and know that when we're going through things and do you feel like animals have that unique ability to do that and they're there for actually my little one oh he's just jumped up on the sofa but yeah (laughs) my little one is very intuitive but my big one I have a pit bull and he was my husband's former wife's dog who passed away uh, before she passed away and he has this innate gift of just knowing when someone's sick or when somebody needs love and so it's great because he hasn't come in here so I'm very happy we're okay but whenever I'm feeling stressed or whenever I get migraines he's right here and if anyone is grieving he'll come straight in and interesting in a reading if I'm doing a reading for a client and he'll be sniffing at the door trying to get in while I'm on Zoom. He'll, it's like, come on. And I'm like, huh. And then I often think, oh, did your dad love animals? I'm like, oh my God. And then often he'll, they'll bring animals in spirit. So it's, I think animals are beautiful. Animals just have, there's no ego. They know when to come in. They know how to touch in on that. I think it's beautiful. I, okay. I, I have to ask now that I, one other thing, I always said we were the, that last thing, but here's another thought that I have is I know when we were talking in Vail, you said at one point, you said, oh, I feel it down my legs. And Mm. I get this sensation in my body sometimes, honestly, when I buy stocks and I can't teach this to anybody because it's me, but it's like when I know I'm supposed to do something, I get like my body warms up almost like I'm freezing and I'm jumping into a hot tub and you know how your body gets a tingly feeling. That's what I feel. And so that's one thing is that is knowing are those, what those feelings are. And then for someone who might be thinking about your courses and certification is what are the signs? How would someone know and say, oh, you know what? I get that kind of feeling all the time. Am I, do I have psychic abilities and should I take this on? So there's two parts. One is what are these feelings? Are these feelings like something going on? And then the second one is how do I know? Maybe I, how do I know if I'm right to be a psychic and maybe I should check this out? So first of all, with the vibration and the body tingling, I get it hitting my knees and riding up my thighs. And it's my, it's just, again, how the body aligns with frequency. So it's the or physical aura that's aligning with the frequency that's actually come in, or you're saying something like, oh my God. So you know that you're on track. So if anyone is thinking that they're a psychic, first of all, if they're thinking they're a psychic, they are a psychic, okay? If they're thinking they're a medium, they're a medium. But often it's more of an intuitive, oh, I'm getting these hits randomly. Oh, I'm getting these hits more often. I'm having these wild dreams. Wow, I'm feeling spirit. And I always say, if you've got this gift, you don't feel like you have to develop it to be a medium psychic or anything else. But it's really good to develop it for your own good, your own sense, the sense of empowerment, just giving comfort. And I think it's very, I'm all about empowering other people to do what I can do, because I feel that then we can stop creating bad names on psychics and mediums as, oh, they're only praying after you and you've had a loss, because we're not. We actually want to empower you to find your own way forward. So I encourage people, if they're having those moments of, God, my intuition is on target, just to explore it. Write things down. I have little post-it notes. I'm feeling this, and I put it on there. And when it happens, I take it off and go, okay, I was right. (laughs) So that might be a good idea for people just to get a gauge. I love that. I love that. Thank you for that. Those are great insights. And uh, so thanks for coming today and being a part of this and definitely want to encourage everyone to check out your page and get involved in your community. And again, we'll post all that. It's Lisa Williams. What is the actual link? And then we'll put it in the chat as well. So it's Lisa. So there's two, there's lisawilliams.com and lisawilliamsschool.com. Okay, great. And you're also on Instagram. So check out the links and 
definitely get more information. Lisa has a great six-week program that's free and also your upcoming program on this weekend. And then the certification's coming up soon too, or you already have those with the ongoing certification program. Lisa, it's been a pleasure to see you and can't wait to see you at the next YBL trip, if not sooner. Thanks, Jill. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.